Hello and welcome to Beyond the 3D. My name is Michael J. Russ, your host. I do appreciate your listenership. I'm dedicating at least the next two episodes to our current racial unrest for two reasons. First, because as one of my listeners aptly put it, this could be one of the most transformative events we experience this century. And two, people want to know how to make a real impact on the issue at hand. White people, black people, gray people, red people, yellow people, every kind of person. And, you know, this is really, I'm going to throw a third reason in there. This is a glorious evolutionary catalyst, or catalytic moment. It is beautiful. And a couple episodes ago, I highlighted what the term evolutionary catalyst is. And this is one of those moments. You come across these moments on a daily basis. However, on a cataclysmic basis, this is one. This whole issue of protesting and racial injustice and everything that, that it represents, the systemic aspects of it, that's all coming to a head right now. And it's, it's, uh, it's well within, deep, I should say, into the consciousness of people. And that's what makes it a catalytic moment. Um, now, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about in this episode. And, uh, you know, calls for the elimination of racist people, systematic policies, laws, street signs, statues, logos, institutions, and more are being heard loud and clear. And change is afoot. It's wonderful. It's beautiful to see, actually. Hopefully, these images these and, and changes that are coming about will be deep and broad enough to generate the personal alchemy necessary to bring about what our society deeply needs. A life for everyone that, has an e that offers an equal chance at personal freedom, happiness, love, and prosperity. It's really what we want, deeply, innately inside. What we've got is a problem with some people being incredibly greedy. 400 years of, of greed and systemic um, put-downs uh, that have uh, really systemically ingrained themselves in our society to the point where uh, a whole class, a race of people, is now completely and totally disenfranchised. And this is not only here in the United States. This system has been put in place around the world by uh, countries who uh, went and conquered other countries and created commonwealths, all that kind of stuff. All slave labor was used to build a lot of wealth. And before we get into, any, into the meat of this episode, I feel it's really important to put us all on a level plating field when it comes to understanding the meaning of systemic and racism, uh, because these words are being bantered around like crazy. Systemic, just to let you know, because you can look it up on Google, uh, is relating to a system, especially as opposed to a particular part, as in race, the, the racism is localized rather than systemic or deep, deeply ingrained. It's like roots. Uh, running through the ground and into everything. It's insidious. Racism means prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership of a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalized. Um, and the belief that different races possess distinct characteristics, abilities, and and uh, qualities, especially so as to distinguish them as inferior or superior to one another. That's what we're dealing with here. This idea that one class or race of people is uh, more inferior or superior than another. And uh, that is at the heart of just about everything that we're looking to change. And I'm making this podcast at the behest of a very good friend of mine and a, and a subscriber to this podcast, a listener who happens to be white. And she asked me to share uh, what, you know, my ideas about how we can address racism from a, a I can say alchemy, metaphysical, a transformative, uh, you know, what this, from beyond the 3D. That's what this show is about. And what she, she revealed to me is that there are other um uh, white friends of hers who are asking the same question. You know, what can we do? What, how, 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 how can I make an impact? How can I myself um, move forward with this whole thing and with this process and be part of it? And we had a great conversation. 
And I wish everyone could have uh, the kind of conversation that we did about the topic of race and racism in the world. And, you know, without fear, uh, judgment or condition, uh, and where there is no right or wrong or ignorant thing to say. People are, come at this from different levels of knowledge, different levels of wisdom and, and uh, enlightenment, and we have to understand that. And that, that wisdom or, or an enlightenment, a level of understanding, is really predicated by our own experiences over time. You know, when you're born to now, you know, if you're 50 years old, you've got 50 years of experiences and enlightenment and wisdom. You also have 50 years of thought viruses, you know, these, these negative thoughts or ideas that have been supplanted, that you've actually contracted, that have been supplanted in your psyche, and you've been operating from them. The next episode is going to dig into that really deep. And what makes the topic of race uh, so challenging uh, to sit down and discuss is the emotional baggage that it, uh, it releases. People who've had experiences um, might not have remembered those experiences, but now, boom, the George Floyd things happen, thing happens, and now all these things are being dredged up, and people have had enough. We've reached a tipping point, as you know, somebody says, and I know that's cliche-ish. However, um, this is what created the catalyst. And if all races really were, were uh, if all races are unable to come together for an honest, open, and sincere conversation about how to unravel this disenfranchising maze of inequity currently being experienced by people of color, nothing will change. If we can't come together and come to an agreement, uh, and if we can't do one other thing, if, if people aren't willing to do the work, the work that I'm going to talk about here in just a moment, it's also going to be a huge challenge. Now, one thing is certain, the conversation, the conversation had by all must come from love, compassion, and understanding, empathy, kindness, and non-judgment. You can never go wrong with any, any conversation when you come from this place, this, this presence, this positive emotional presence. So where do you go from here now? How do you turn lead into gold? with this whole issue of racism and, and uh, inequality. How do you do that? How do you turn lead into gold? You know, because life is a classroom where you think, feel, and act from a higher level. The answer to this question is very simple. Go within. You have to go within. Now, I say this with all sincerity because all external change External transformation begins with inner transformation within you, within your heart and your mind. And much inner transformation is necessary if we are to put a dent, just a dent, into the multifaceted subject of racism, into the multifaceted ramifications and consequences of the systemic racism that exists in this country and around the world. Let's not leave that out. It exists everywhere. Now, when you transform your thoughts, self-talk, feelings, and actions towards other races and genders, when you transform your vibration, your consciousness, your energy, your presence, you manifest a corresponding transformation in your immediate outer world. And although videos of unarmed African-American deaths at the hands of police have been surfacing for years, Really, I ask you, what has made the unfortunate death, the tragic death of George Floyd, such an evolutionary catalyst for personal transformation and change? In my view, the nine-minute video, the almost nine-minute video of that that was documented, um, that documented his last breath, breath and, and, and the whole process, was the last straw for many people. And the pent-up energy from the lockdown coupled with millions of layoffs, a lot of time to think, and the coronavirus, you know, from the coronavirus has created the perfect storm. That's what it's done. So beyond that, the question I had to ask is, how are you choosing to be in relationship to systemic raci racism, to racial injustice? Because you're always in relationship to every event. That's your consciousness, how you're, you're perceiving it. How are you perceiving that you are in relationship to racism? The 3D events that drive racial inequity and injustice are real. Even 
they might not be they might be invisible to you you must realize that you have a choice to either ignore them or dig deep into your heart and do the inner work necessary to elevate your consciousness and transform yourself and society as a whole as a result now I I think the saying goes, be the change you want to see in the world. I've heard that one uh, bantered about. The desire for transforming our society multiplies exponentially when masses of people, which is what's happening right now, masses of all races, embrace the same shift in consciousness at the same time. This is the catalytic, the, the, the energy that comes out of this catalytic moment that makes it so evolutionary. And what often often really gets lost in the mix is that policies, regulations, principles, laws, systems, and constructs that exist to discriminate against and ultimately disenfranchise an entire race and class of people don't just appear. They have been put in place and reinforced over time by people, individuals, people with racist perceptions and delusions of white privilege. It's individuals that have done this. The system exists because individuals built the system. People with those thoughts, those perceptions. For example, this is really interesting. I just caught this in the paper yesterday. Alabama's main state history agency is acknowledging that it helped perpetuate systemic racism for generations by promoting Confederate narratives while ignoring those of black people. They said... For well over half a century, the agency committed extensive resources to the acquisition of Confederate records and artifacts while declining to acquire and preserve materials documenting the lives and contributions of African Americans in Alabama. The agency said it is now redirecting itself to telling a fuller story of the state. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing, the rub about this whole thing. For decades and decades since this agency has been in existence, school kids have been parading through this history center, this history agency, looking, kids of all colors, black, white, yellow, red, green, blue, brown, whatever, they have been coming through and getting half the story, half the story, which is one of these major problems that we have in our educational system. In our books, they're giving half the story. They're not giving a true depiction based on, I don't know, be that because of guilt or uh, people who wrote the books. Again, this is all people. See, it all filters down. As soon as you have this, someone who has a perception of, of, of inferiority and delusions of, of white privilege, they infect everything with thought viruses, everything that they touch in whatever discipline they're an expert in. And here's a fun factoid. Alabama's capital is where the Confederacy was formed in 1861. And their president, okay, their Confederate president, Jefferson Davis, was elected. Boy, little factoid there for you. Okay, that's enough of history for this moment. Racism, my friends, is a perception. This is what I want you to grasp, that racism is a perception, a negative perception, and white privilege Believing you are entitled is also a perception as well. You perceive yourself as superior. You perceive yourself as, as privileged. You perceive yourself as above, and that someone you perceive that someone else is below you. So, perceptions, which I talk about a lot in this in this podcast, are extremely important for your own personal transformation. And it's important to view white privilege, racism as perceptions because there's something you choose. You choose them. Consciously or subconsciously, you you do choose them. And as such, they can be transformed through alchemy, what I talk about in this podcast consistently because that's what it's about. It's about your, this is all about you. Everything else out there is just an event. You're the one who makes it what it is. You're the one who perceives it and and goes through the process of of labeling it and the you know the 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 consequential um feelings and self-talk and uh the actions and responses you have as a result of that perception 
You know, here's an, here's an interesting thing. Another example of this, Daryl Davis. This is an example of, of, of perceptions being transformed and how, as a choice, they can be. Daryl Davis is a black blues musician and a protagonist. Uh, he's the protagonist of a new documentary called Daryl Davis Making Friends from Enemies. Enemies, And I would, I would look it up. Daryl Davis Making Friends from Enemies. En- enemies. Wow, that's an interesting word. Friends from Enemies. And Daryl is a master alchemist. That's, that's my uh, perception of him. And he applied the elements of contrast and relational connection to very important elements in inner alchemy to find common ground through shared interest, to receive 200 robes from members of the Ku Klux Klan over the last 30 years. Using blues music as a common interest, Davis befriends individual Klan members over time, several meetings, developing a friendship through his ability to be honest about what he and the Klan members have in common. These similarities have opened a pathway for manifesting lasting inner transformation that has led these men, 200 and counting, to renounce their clan membership and send Davis their robes as a keepsake memento. Now, he says he never asked them to send them send him their robes. They did this transformation on their own. Because through contrast, they understood, you see, that They'd never sat down with a black person before. They'd never had a conversation with a black person before. They, they were fed these ideologies, these racist ideologies, by people of their same race and everything that went along with it. So they were fed all these thought viruses, and those thought viruses needed to be dispelled. And what Davis does is sit down, and he dispels all these thought viruses that they've had, that, they've, they've, that have evolved with them over time, through family and friends and now the Klan organization. And Daryl's transformative work is relevant to this episode and the times we are living in because the 200 clan robes he has in his home, in his closet, have come from men who inhabit every corner of society, including law enforcement, from coast to coast. And of their own accord, these men have transformed their negative perceptions of superiority, which have in turn, positively transform their thoughts, inner conversations, feelings, and actions towards blacks and other people. And that is the beauty of it. This is what I mean when I use the term inner work. These men performed the inner work. They transformed themselves through contrast, through exposing themselves to contrast and relational connection with someone who was not like them the person they were demonizing. Now, growing up around the world, I've seen this kind of transformation firsthand, and I can tell you it's magnificent. It is magnificent to witness. You feel so good inside that you know, when it happens, it's, it's, it's magical. Now, I will assume you are consciously aware enough to, rec- to realize that our society needs to change in dramatic fashion. That we know. Equality and justice for all, regardless of race, gender, or sexual preference, is not only a right, it's also a social imperative if we are to thrive, prosper, and live happily in this world going forward. That I think we can all agree on. If your perception is that someone else is the problem, that someone else is responsible for perpetuating systemic racism in our society, then you make yourself part of the problem. You become part of the problem yourself just by that perception, especially if you're white. To become part of the solution, you must change these perceptions because everyone, and I do mean everyone, it's including me, has a hand in sharing responsibility for developing and sustaining a system of racism in this country and around the world. Now, I know there will be people who will likely disagree about that, right? Disagree. I say this because, and this is what I would tell them, The element of personal responsibility as an element of alchemy in the practice of inner alchemy, of transformation, dictates that if you are not willing to take responsibility for a problem, any problem, pointing fingers perhaps and placing blame, making yourself a victim, you render yourself powerless to fix it. There's no way we're going to fix systemic racism if we approach it from the perspective of blame and victimization. 
That is my view. It's not going to happen. As a white person, if you engage in microaggression and make offhanded comments like, you don't sound black. That's a, a form of microaggression, something I myself have heard a million times. Or perhaps you mimic urban slang. You're engaging in systemic racist actions if you do. Microaggressions, adopting uh, somebody else's culture, black culture, that to, 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 to fit in perhaps, if that's what you're looking to do, that is, um, th- those are racist actions. What you need to do is be yourself and let others be themselves without judgment and without condition. That's how we start to move through this. As you can see how you, how we all individually are a part of this issue. And when you change within you, and you call it out when it's happening, when you see it, that's how we begin to change. I speak one ang- one language because I grew up around the world, and that's English. And I still travel the world, and when I'm allowed to, <laughs> right now I'm not allowed to, and when I do, I do use English to communicate with people. Uh, in, in, I'm talking C-spot run English, plain English. Graphic slang, geographic slang and colloquial terminology cannot be misunderstood by other cultures, by someone who's, who's from another, uh, speaks another language and is looking to adopt English as their second language. They don't, they don't understand that. You'll end up explaining, they'll look at you like a deer in the headlights, and it, believe me, it's happened. And so a lot of what I write doesn't have slang or colloquialisms, geographic uh, terminology uh, specific to an area I live in of, of the country or whatever. It doesn't have those. I don't have a lot of analogies that other people can't understand. You know, that you have to, and, and I say this because in, if you go to Hawaii, you're going to find, you're going to find that Pidgin English is, uh, is, uh, is spoken um, by local peoples including white people, believe it or not, who have adopted it to, to fit in, to be part of the Hawaiian culture. But Pidgin English exists, uh, it exists in the Philippines when we were living there. Uh, it's an adaptation of the English language combined with uh, local terminology. And if they leave Hawaii, then no one else is going to understand what they talk like, unless what they're saying, unless they can speak actual C-spot run English. Now, in my view, transformative inner alchemy is the key to solving systemic racism and curbing racial bias because it gives one of us the power, each one of us, I should say, the power to consistently transform our thoughts, self-talk, feelings, and actions in real time. This is important. This is really important. You turn lead into gold by transforming yourself. I think I've said that once. I'll say it a zillion times. This problem is going to be solved by us individually transforming ourselves. Once we, individually and as a society, have transformed our negative perceptions about other races and individuals, we can apply this transformation to eliminate systemic policies, laws, politics, justice issues, justice system itself, uh, human resources departments, in corporations and companies, corporate culture as, 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 a, as a whole, education, housing, banking, lending, and more, where systemic racism exists presently because people who are thinking with racist perceptions are operating in these areas. In my view, your inner work must begin with a simple inner realization that everyone has bias be it racial, gender, or otherwise. Just accept this and take responsibility for this fact. Everyone, black people have bias, racial bias. White people have racial bias. Everybody does. Every culture in the world has a racial bias. You have biases about people. And bias is the result of a negative perception you picked up as, uh, as you were exposed to experiences on your journey through life. So let's just say this. Inner work must begin. It begins with me taking responsibility for the fact that, yes, I have racial bias. However, as we're all works in progress, we have the ability to, trans- ability to it, within the concepts of, of, of realization, when we understand, we become aware of our bias, we can immediately at that particular point transform 
that perception and then make different, have different thoughts and feelings arise as a result. And, of course, actions and responses as a result. That's what this is about. If you're an avid listener of this podcast, you are well aware of the innate power of perception when it comes to using alchemy and, and to ultimately transform how you feel. That's really what it's about. Once you choose to transform a perception, the corresponding change is almost magical. The change in how you're, what you're thinking about that person. And, and think about this. In real life, this is you engaging with someone of a different race under whatever the circumstances, and you have a thought a thought that could be bias, and you recognize that you're having that thought. And what you do is the inner work in that moment to transform that perception about that person. You let that thought go, and you engage with that person in a different way, in a new way, perhaps. And that perception is just blown out of the water. As a society, we are going to have to go deep within to examine and transform perceptions about race <laughs> that are completely, totally inaccurate, fabricated, falsely reinforced, and compounded by thought viruses and, uh, and, and, and policies, systemic you know, roots throughout our society for, for 400 years. When you're willing to take a good look inside without fear of self-judgment and commitment to transforming negative or inaccurate perceptions about people of different races and genders, you ignite your ability and raw power to transform that narrative of racial and socioeconomic inequality through right thought, word, feeling, and action. That's what you have the power to do, all right? Another way of envisioning what needs to be done to eradicate an alarming level of systemic inequality, disenfranchisement, legal and social injustice, brutality, and brutality that we've been seeing on t television uh, so much now because everybody has a camera, is to approach it from the standpoint of computer programming. I just want to give you a different way of seeing this, okay, how to, how to uh, you know, eliminate the problem. But if you look at it as computer programming, you know, it might make some sense. And I try to come at this from different angles so that what I'm saying can be understood because everybody understands something, you know, a, a different way. One person may understand what I just said, and another person may be a little bit, you know, as a listener, you might be, huh? What is that? Yeah, well, let's put it in terms of computer programming. In, in my view, the systemic racism we have today is the intended result of malicious code. Individuals have systematically and intentionally programmed into every fabric of our society. As I said, this is people. People did this. Ridding the, ridding the people and the fabric of our society of malicious, racially biased code will likely take generations. So don't hold your breath. It didn't happen. <laughs> you know, taking down a few... Civil War statues, removing a, a few racially derived brand logos from the grocery shelves and outlawing brutal police practices and banning Confederate flags and monuments just scratches the surface of what is necessary to even the playing field and does nothing to transform the mindsets of the people who have, uh, who have done this, who created these, these uh, institutions overtly and covertly to maintain the status quo. You know, these people have done whatever's necessary. Okay? The, the, and, and changing, there's a lot of there's surface change going on right now. And that doesn't change anything. For example, um, it's taking down a Confederate monument, monument is not going to change the lending practice at a bank. A racial, racially biased lending practice at a, at a financial institution. It's not going to do that. That person who is in charge of giving that loan, who's looking at various names and saying, oh, that name sounds black, so I think we're not going to do that loan. That name sounds white. Let's, let's give them a call. That's who you have to change, that person. You can put a, you can put a law in place that says you can't do that. There, there are laws in place that say you can't discriminate. Equal housing opportunity. We're an equal housing opportunity, you know, equal opportunity lender. However, it's the person who sits there and looks at the loan documents, who is creating and perpetuating, I should say perpetuating the racial, uh, the systemic racism within the banking industry. 
And if you desire to make a real impact on racism and the finite, the infinite forms of inequality in our society, take the time to take the time to illuminate any biased perceptions about race that you have and do the work to transform them. So your thoughts, words, feelings, and lead actions and responses can support racial equality, justice, inclusion in every area of our society. Other than focusing on what you can control, your inner work, because that's all you can control here. You can't dictate other people do things. People have to change from within on their own. And this is, again, through contrast, through, uh, rec- through relational connection uh, and other uh, ways of alchemy, inner alchemy. So here are a few actions that I know, and I'm thinking about this uh, as I'm walking, that you can actually do to foster greater equality and inclusion uh, right there in your own neck of the woods. Here's number one, actually. Seek out contrasting conversations and relational connections and experiences with people of different races. Do you take a cruise to a third world country and segregate yourself from locals when you leave the ship? I know people, and I've seen them do it. They go to an incredible country and never talk to anyone who actually lives there. They get on a bus, they take a tour, they see a place, they get back on the bus, they go back to the ship. They never engage with anyone. That's the beauty of going to a different place, is meeting the people and finding out how they feel about their lives, their cooking, their, their culture, their government. You can find out a lot when you have conversations with people. Next, if you belong to a private club or organization with no members of color or very few members of color, respectively, and no active efforts to recruit them, why are you still a member? Next, support businesses owned by people of color. Amazon is not owned by people of color. It's owned by the richest man in the world. So... Do you look around your community? Do you Google to find out if there's a local business that has what you're looking for? The other thing people don't understand, because Amazon is so huge and convenient, is that when you ship money off to Amazon, it goes into Jeff Bezos' pocket. It leaves your city. I like to shop locally. And I encourage you to do the same, not only because there are entrepreneurs in your city who are, who are in need of supporting themselves and their families and who are looking to prosper. Make sure that you're including everyone. I'll drive across town to get something from someone. You know what? And when I do, I meet someone, I make a new friend. And when you make a new friend, you'll do anything for them and they'll do anything for you. That is what will happen. When we were adding an extension to our house, I ordered the contractor that we used, the local contractor, to use subcontractors of color and businesses owned by people of color. You'd be surprised at how many we actually used. Nobody's asking for charity. This is not about charity. They have to be qualified to be able to do the work and have, just like anybody else, you have to vet them just like anyone else. You're just looking for an opportunity to apply their trade and to move up the economic ladder. And you have to give them that opportunity. You have to keep the money in your community. That's the most important thing. You know, I I don't shop at Walmart. I'll just come right out and say that. I don't shop at Walmart. I don't like their practices. I don't like their employment practices. Um, They're they're a billion-dollar institution, in my view, that's been built on the backs of, of people who have been economically disenfranchised. And also they have put a lot of family businesses, long-standing family businesses that actually were very supportive economically in the community that created jobs and not only put money, you know, they bought houses in the community and, and they, they shopped at all the grocery stores and all the stores and they supported the other businesses in the community. They put those businesses out of business through a model of buying cheap and uh, paying people less and uh, no health insurance and part-time employees. It's, it's basically, it's you know, it's, it's the perfect storm when it comes to creating a billion-dollar business on the backs of other people, and many corporations do this. I would rather go to a locally-owned business, to the local Ace Hardware is owned by, it's a franchise owned by someone who lives in 
this town, who, who pays taxes in this community, who supports this community economically. Think about that as well. Now, share your wisdom. There's another one. Share your wisdom and knowledge with a person of color. I often encounter young black men and women who want to get into my particular career field, but they don't know how. They have a vision. They have a thought. They have an idea. They see that other people, perhaps, that it's possible, but they don't know how to proceed. So I make myself available to assist them in any way I can. And whether or not they take me up on that is not up to me. I extend a hand, and it's up to them to take that hand. Next, become more enlightened about the black experience. Interestingly enough, right now I just heard that the that black books, black bookstores are on fire, selling more than ever, being more prosperous than ever, and I love this. You know, there are lots of tributaries that come out of positive tributaries that that come that have, that have flowed out of uh, George Floyd's passing. Wouldn't it be interesting? Yeah, just is just I was thinking about this the other day and talking with my girlfriend. Wouldn't it be, be interesting if this, if this man said, I'm going to incarnate, I'm going to, and, and at such and such an age, I'm going to be in a position where I have this happen to me and it's going to reverberate throughout the entire world to change people's minds, perceptions, cultures, feelings. It's going to have this, it's going to be an in a, in a, in a evolutionary catalyst. That's what it's going to be. And if you think about this, put it in those terms, it, it is an amazing thing that has happened, that has occurred, that, is, that has been born out of this, this uh, tragic situation, that this person uh, has had such an impact in such a very, very short period of time, and I hope it continues to reverberate outward. Books, movies, lectures, interviews, direct conversations, expose yourself, expose yourself to the black experience. Again, this is about contrast. Again, two, it's not only a black experience. White Fragility was written, written by a white woman. I heard about uh, a Facebook uh, post from uh, Brene Brown, B-R-E-N-E, B as in boy, E-R-N-E, Brown, Brene Brown. White woman who talks about it, evidently, who, who, who created a video um, that very simply explains what white fragility is. I have not had an opportunity to watch the video, but I've had three comments from people and said, wow, this is amazing. Once we know things, we can dispel, we're, we're looking to dispel perceptions that are backed up by thought viruses, negative ideas, and, 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 and thoughts that, that are ingrained within us. We don't even know it, but they're there. Next, when you witness the slightest hint of racial injustice, call it out. Don't just acquiesce to, being, to it being the way things are. Gosh, I hate that. How often does that happen? Something happens and people just say, oh, it's, not my, it's none of my business. Now it is your business. It is your business. Call it out. Make the other person aware of what they're doing. Next, vet candidates for local community school boards and political positions for their views about race and equality. Ask them the question flat out. What have you done? What's your position? School board members, wow. There was a great, uh, there's a great video on YouTube that I saw. Reverend, Reverend Chambers, Gary Chambers is his name, out of um, Louisiana. And... It was either Louisiana, I think it was Louisiana or Mississippi. Maybe it was Mississippi. And uh, he went to the school board, which was three black and two white, and he chastised the heck out of a white woman who was sitting there uh, during the board meeting, school board meeting, and she was shopping online. She wasn't paying attention to anything that people were saying. And he, somebody had taken a picture of it and put it, um, I think just took some video of uh, kind of back behind, they saw what she was looking at on her screen and sent it to him. And he came up, he was, in the, he was in the audience, he came up and he just called her out. He called her out. Now the, the board was meeting because um, they, the African Americans in the community for decades had been looking to get the name Robert E. Lee Elementary School 
off the elementary school. Wow. And the, the community is 70% black. So you can imagine these kids going to school and to a school named after a Confederate general who was incredibly violent and brutal towards his slaves. I mean, amazingly. So this man's conversation, he called out not only the black board members who he complimented for, you know, hey, this is the most cohesive that you've been in a long time. You know, you've finally got some cojones. Let's roll with this. And he called out the whites as well, saying that, hey, you, I hear you're, <laughs> you're a, a fair person. Other people have told me, people of color have told me you're a fair person. So be fair. And literally that evening they voted to get rid of the name Robert E. Lee uh, Elementary School and uh, name it after uh, someone who was not racist, who didn't own slaves <laughs> in the community can't tell you the name because that wasn't part of the video. But they did vote that evening to do something that blacks in the community had been trying to do for decades. Next, support anti-voter suppression efforts in your state. When you see injustice going on, write a letter, make a call. That's the successful response. If you can do something that will help in any given way, shape, or form, you must do it. Or negative feelings are there going to be the result? Next, if you're doing business with a large company as a customer and only see white people working for them, ask whether they have any people of color under their employ or a program to promote people of color. As a white person, you would be surprised at how honest an answer you will receive. All right. Above all, approach the topic of racism and its mind-blowing historical ramifications and consequences with love, kindness, empathy, and compassion, and a desire for better understanding. I'm loving the fact that black authors, are uh, their books are selling out like wildfire. There are some awesome books. See the movie Do the Right Thing by Spike Lee. came out, I don't know, 25 years ago. An amazing movie. Spike is... is, is is great at uh, depiction of circumstances, black the black experience. So check it out. I think I've given you enough to chew on for right now, no doubt. Racism is a loaded topic with many different tangents, many different sides. And I hope I've set the stage for some inner work that will illuminate the shift in perception you need to make a contribution to more equality, inclusion, and acceptance of all races, genders, and genders in your community. If you're white and witness another white person speaking or acting out of perceived privilege, speaking or acting in a biased way at home or work or as you're out and about, don't just let it happen because you think it's none of your business. I've said this before, but it needs emphasis. I do it all the time, and I'm black. As a silent witness, you perpetuate systemic racism, the same systemic racism that you really want to root out. As I said, don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. Transform within. Make some changes within. And when you call somebody out, that's a shift in you. Be more assertive. Make the right move. Do what's necessary. Illuminate their actions. In my next podcast, I'll share the next bit of turning lead into gold, of your inner transformational work, the work you can perform to, uh, to help assist, the, to create the greater good, okay, to, to contribute to the greater good, I should say, and help eliminate the root cause of what we're dealing with right now, the root causes of systemic racism. And I'll discuss, of course, thought viruses and the, and the role they play in the perceptions associated with racial, bi racial bias and systemic racism. Now, I've already got this episode almost completed, so it'll be out in the next couple of, uh, probably the next four days. And until then, let what I've shared thus far sink in. Heighten your awareness of racially biased perceptions that you might be harboring. Those perceptions that are driving your thoughts your inner conversations, self-talk about yourself and what, and, and what you're thinking about and 
how re- you're relating to other people, and what you're capable of, and your responses. Then do your best, your utmost, to actively transform any negative perceptions that you find. Weed out, root out the thought viruses, those negative thoughts that are driving your thought viruses. Thank you for sharing this podcast with your friends, family, work associates, of course. And if we're all to transform our culture, we must get busy doing the work within right now. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, please send me an email. Love to hear from you at inquiry. That's I-N-Q-U-I-R-Y, inquiry at michaeljrust.com. And I will promptly get right back to you. If you're looking for an inspirational speaker to enlighten your audience about Nash, about relational sales, how to engage your inner alchemist, uh, to transform from within so that the rest of your environment will change as well, this is great as a team, um, team talk, team presentation. Or you're looking for an innovative way of approaching challenges and adversity, something called zero adversity. I'd be happy to, sk- to speak with you to connect with you. Next time is going to be awesome. And until then, be well, be secure, and be happy. Thank you.